Tomorrow is a day to remember that the time is always right to do what is right. To remember that injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. To remember that forgiveness is not an occasional act, but a permanent attitude. To remember that faith is taking the first step, even when you don't see the whole staircase. To remember that our lives begin to end the day that we become silent about the things that matter. To remember that darkness cannot drive out darkness, only light can do that. And that hate cannot drive out hate, no, only love can do that. To remember to never succumb to the temptation of bitterness. To remember that out of the mountain of despair, a stone of hope. To remember that we still have a dream. What a great reminder we have to remember Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. this weekend, who not only did a great uh, deal for our country in the name of civil rights, but a voice to the oppressed, marginalized, the voiceless, uh, and also went about it in a way that's very different than most people uh, throughout history. You heard his words, two of to my favorite quotes right in that video, hate can't drive out hate, only love can. Come on, somebody. Darkness can't drive out darkness. Only light can. And so uh, uh, I think his words ring as true today and are as needed today as they were almost 60, 70 years ago. And so we celebrate him. Uh, and for some of you who didn't know why you didn't have to go to work on Monday or the banks are closed, now you know. Um, but uh, also one of my favorite, my, my most favorite thing about Dr. King is a follower of Jesus. Everything he did uh, came from the words in Jesus. In fact, it's, it's so fitting that this is Martin Luther King weekend because we're gonna talk about uh, our series. We're gonna talk about what I think he exemplified uh, and the paradoxical backwardsness of what it means to be great in the kingdom. Before I dive in, I wanna say, um, I'm just, as a pastor, I'm so proud of you guys. How many of you are praying and fasting? Um, a lot of people are encouraging each other. A lot of you are giving up stuff. We're seeing posts and you're telling me we're already seeing God move in people's lives. And so um, in case you didn't know, we started on Thursday, our 21 days of prayer with our prayer books. You can get those if you don't have them. Also available digitally for all of you online, as well as um, uh, uh, fasting. We're encouraging people to give stuff up. And, and I'm really, really proud of how many of you are leaned into that. And I'm so excited for what God's going to do. And, and for some of you, are like, man, what's with the jersey? Uh, a couple things. I know the Super Bowl is in a few weeks. Uh, just a reminder, we're still world champs. But I also think this weekend might be the last weekend that that's true. So uh, I wanted to have one last hoorah. And, uh, uh, and so um, you, we, everybody always wear, you guys always wear your colors. I wanted to wear them as well. And um, I know the rest of the country this weekend, like we're legit praying for you. It's dangerous. Uh, the polar vortex is real. It might drop below 60 here tonight. So you can pray for us as well. Um, <laughs> It's not there yet, but it could be tonight. And a lot of long sleeves in church, so. But for real, be safe. You know when they're moving NFL games, it's bad, right? Like if Buffalo, New York is like, we can't play football today, it's bad. And that's what happened uh, this weekend, so. Um, but hey, we're in the book of Philippians. Little quick backdrop of, of what's happened in Philippians. Paul uh, is, the apostle Paul wrote a letter to the Philippians in Philippi, a church he started 10 years previously, a very military ba uh, a place. Uh, it was a place that had Roman citizenship where, uh, where where, um, a lot of, where a lot of Roman military people would go to retire. He comes and introduces the way of Jesus, starts this, this, this following this church, and they're doing well, but it's really hard. And so Paul's using his hard times to talk to the Philippians about their hard times, about how do we go through hard times together. And so last week we kicked off our Philippians series in chapter one. I'm gonna start chapter two today. We're gonna finish chapter two next weekend, and we're going through the book of Philippians, which matches our 21 days of prayer. And so I wanna dive in, and Paul is going to, 
to really give us a blueprint and a template. This is probably one of my favorite passages of scripture. I have literally built my life on two of the verses that we're gonna cover today. Uh, but, but to set the stage of where we're gonna go, I wanna remind us of some of the last words Paul said last week in chapter one, because he says this, and then he's gonna kind of go into it today. And so last week we kind of left off here. Philippians chapter one, uh, Paul said that whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Jesus. So his instruction to any Jesus follower is, hey, no matter what you go through, Christians, conduct yourselves in a manner that's worthy of the life and the example of Jesus. In other words, a great way to put it would be your life, my life, should be consistent with the good news of Jesus. Come on, somebody, right? Our lives should mirror that. And so, um, so he says, conduct yourselves. And now, chapter two, he's about to go in on what he means by that. So somebody who's ready to be uh, in the word and excited to be in church, say, let's go. All right, Philippians chapter two, verse one says this. Therefore, if any, if any of you have encouragement, somebody say encouragement, from being united with Christ. Any comfort, somebody say comfort, from his love. Any common sharing, somebody say common sharing. In the spirit, any tenderness, somebody say tenderness. Any compassion, somebody say compassion. Paul lists a bunch of stuff. If you have, let me summarize this for you. If God's done anything for you. That's really what Paul's saying. If God, if you have experienced God, if he's real at all, if you've experienced him at all, if, he's, if any of these things exist in your life, and what's interesting, I love a little tidbit about that word if in the Greek. It doesn't mean like, I don't know if he has or hasn't, but if he has. It's actually, the, the context of the word is if and since it is so. It's kind of almost this psych, uh, uh, sarcastic rhetoric of like, if your mom has ever done anything for you. It's like, we all know we wouldn't even be here if it wasn't for our mom. Of course she has. That's the if he's saying. So he's like, in life, of the fact that I know you wouldn't even be here if it wasn't for Jesus, if, and what always follows an if, uh, then. So if God, so here's where we're at, if God has done anything for you, then, verse two, make my joy complete by being like-minded, unity, having the same love, unity, being one in spirit, unity, and of one mind, unity. Am I making that up? Paul's like, hey, if God's done anything, be unified, be of unity. Again, Dr. Martin Luther King, kind of the same message. Like one day, maybe we won't be judged by the color of our skin, but the content of our character, maybe we can come together by what unites us, not be divided by what separates us, right? 60 years old, we still are a long ways to go in that. And Paul's saying the same thing. He's saying, I want you to be unified, but he says, having the same love, that word love there, is one of the many Greek words of love. It's agape. Agape is the highest form of love. It is self-sacrifice. It's I'm gonna go down so you can go up. I'll sacrifice so you can win. I'll even lose so you can win. He says, if you have any of that, he goes, if God's done anything for you, and then he's gonna say, make my joy complete by being like-minded. So Paul's gonna give us three things. And, and there's a couple uh, note-taking things here. This might be worth writing down. He's saying, if God's done anything, here's my instruction to you. Number one, get along with each other. That's the message. It's like, oh, I just can't wait to get into the deep word of God. Maybe we'll break down some Hebrew and Greek. What's Paul really saying? He's like, y'all need to get along. Get along with each other. And I think that Paul, if he was alive today, wrote a letter to the American church, he might say something like, hey, if God's done anything for you, y'all need to get along. Thank you. Okay, you're with me. A couple will be with you. So he's saying, get along. And, and then he's going to go into verse three and four, which maybe my two favorite verses in the New Testament that aren't the words of Jesus. He says this, verse three, go to verse three. Do only a few things. Do as much as you feel like. No, do nothing. Somebody online better be typing nothing. Like, no, he's saying it wrong. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Instead, or rather, in humility, come back to that word in a minute, value others above yourself. When was the last time you saw brand marketing commercial saying, guess what? Other people are more important than you. Don't worry about you, take care of them. Said no one ever in this culture, right? Paul is literally redefining this idea of Jesus following of, of what greatness is. He's saying, do nothing. He's saying, do nothing out of selfish ambition. What's selfish ambition? You to get ahead. Or vain conceit, meaning thinking higher of yourself than you should. In fact, he doubles down. He says, in humility, value others above yourselves. He goes on in verse four, even going further into this. He says, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. 
So first he's saying, hey, if God's done anything, get along. And second, number two, put others first. See, here's what I love about the gospel. It's actually not that complicated. I like to think I'm a, I'm a pretty simple person. Um, and I love the gospel because I can wrap my heart in my, it's, it's not easy, but it's simple. He's saying, hey, if, if you have Jesus, if he's done something in your life, get along with each other and, fi- and then put others first. And so, in fact, many versions say, consider, this is consider others better than yourself. Yes, it feels awkward in here. <laughs> Why? Because that is so psychologically and politically incorrect now. It's like, oh, how dare you? How dare Paul? How dare Jesus? Put others ahead of, consider others better. And listen, I know we, 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 we struggle with this, but we shouldn't. I wanna stop and camp here for a minute because this shouldn't be as hard as we make it. First of all, the concept of biblical humidity, humility, humidity, humility, uh, <laughs> I've become one of them. Um, the concept of biblical humility is so much different than the world. Biblical humility, people are better than you. I mean, could you imagine if somebody went on like, I don't know, TikTok or Instagram or CNN or Fox or whatever, and, hey, you know what? I just think people are better than me. People are better than you. Like, who's this guy? And who, uh, you've never met my neighbor and my boss. And uh, 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 but, but the truth is by definition, I mean, just a simple stat, 50% of us are below average. <laughs> I'm just saying. Now, the problem is, all of us put ourselves on, <laughs> you just got that. Uh, like, you really got it. Uh, the problem is, we all put ourselves on a certain half of that spectrum, right? But truth, but all jokes aside, like, yeah, well, of course that's true, statistically. But who do you think you are? But here's what's really important about us. God is not saying you should be down on yourself. That is not biblical. Biblical humility is like, yep, you're right, God, I am. Well, I'm an Eeyore, woe is me. I mean, I just, I'm like the most wretched human ever. Like that is not biblical humidity. Humility, oh my God. (laughs) It's not even humid today, it's nice. We have the polar vortex, wind from the north. It's like 62 degrees, it's beautiful. Bunch of sissies wearing long sleeves. Sorry, I called some of you sissies. God's not saying be down on yourself. Consider others better than you. This is easy. Let me help you with this. Give you a couple examples. I'm gonna, a wedding. A wedding, right? I'm gonna ask you a question that is not a gotcha question. Who are the two stars of a wedding? The bride and the mother-in-law. I mean, the bride. <laughs> oh, I got some stories. Um, the, the bride and the groom, right? We all go to a wedding and we know what to expect. What? Today ain't about me. It's about them, right? And really, there's really one star, and it is the bride. And we know that. It's like, hey, today's not about you, it's about them. So we get this. It shouldn't be hard for us, right? Like, that, that day, they're more important than us. They're more valuable. And anybody who doesn't get that, we think lots of things about you. We talk about you for the rest of our life. Remember that wedding where da-da-da, she was just all about her? Like, hey, it's not your, like, we talk about you for the rest of your life. If you make the wedding about you, and you are not the bride or the groom. I don't know if you know that, but stop it. I got some stories about that too. I've only had to threaten two families in 20 years of ministry. Wedding. And then, and then you have the, the vows and they do and I do and I kiss and, thus, uh, and then you walk in and then there's this beautiful, like the music's going and there's food, but there's this table at the front. None of us would be like, hey, I think I'm gonna sit over there. <laughs> I will admit, again, I'm nobody's perfect here, including me. I, there was one time, a good friend of ours, there were a couple of us, we were like, well, let's go, let's do it. And we were this close to doing it. We were young, dumb 20s. And the only reason, we were like, even us, like even we have a line. We will not sit at the head table as just schmucks at this wedding. We would have done it if, if for him, but we said we won't do it because of her. You know what I mean? Like it was like one of our friend's weddings. So like, right, but the wedding's about them. It's, 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 it's or if, like think about like a celebrity that you hold in high regard or something. And they come over like your favorite celebrity, Tiger, Michael Jordan, maybe a singer, Taylor Swift. And she brought Travis Kelsey and oh my God. Like, uh, you know, like, they come to your house all of a sudden, you're like, hey, let me clean up, what can I get you? Oh, do you have any steak? Absolutely, you drive an hour to Costco, come back, what kind of rub, like, right? All of a sudden we take on a certain mentality, why? I'm no longer the most important person in my house. My favorite celebrity's here, I want him to like me, I want him to come back, right? I say that because this idea, well, consider others more important than you, that's not hard for us, we do it all the time, we just have a hard time when somebody tells us we should do it, right? Consider others, give a better seat, like maybe you need, what? just what if? Imagine, imagine for a second, I'm being serious for a minute. Next time you get cut off in traffic 
Instead of be like, oh, who do you think you are? I was there first time right away. Ah! Something in you went, man, they must be in a real hurry. They have somewhere they really need to get to go. I hope they make it. I hope everybody's okay. God bless them and keep them safe. What if? Some of you are gonna have an opportunity to do that before you even leave our property. <laughs> it happens every weekend. That's why we have, a, we have to hire a cop because you guys are crazy in our parking lot. <laughs> you know, road rage at church, gotta go. <laughs> it's their fault I'm late. Or next time somebody mistreats you, what if we had this internal security that I'm okay with God? Like, man, this must not be about me right now. Something terrible must have happened to them. God, I don't know what's going on in their life, but help them to experience your love and your joy and your healing and whatever they need, right? So let me talk about humility for a quick second and we gotta move on. Humility, biblical humility is not a low opinion of self. It's just considering others first. Do you understand this? It's not a low opinion of others, of self. It's, it's others first. Who was the most humble person ever in the Bible? Jesus, did he ever defer or prefer to people? Always, right? He, he always, in humility, he always deferred. He always preferred. He always did. Did he have a low opinion of himself? Never. In fact, he's quoted by being like, guess what? I'm God. <laughs> Multiple times. I mean, it came out more King James like, uh, if you have seen the father, you have seen me. You know, like uh, similar to that. In fact, uh, jump to John. J J J yeah, I tell them I am. Yeah, uh, go to John 13, three. This is Jesus is washing the disciples' feet. He's about to serve. He's about to wash their feet. But watch what he says. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things in his power and he had come from God and returning to God. Does that sound like a guy with an identity crisis? Who's like, ah, I'm just nobody. You know, I'm God. So, so two things can exist at the same time. Power, authority, a, a high a, a understanding who you are, yet always deferring and always preferring. And really, I bet if Dr. King was still alive, I, I really believe everything I've read and studied, he would say this. I'm not saying you can't have privilege and power. I'm just saying use what you got to help somebody. Because that's what King was doing. It's what Paul teaches. It's what Jesus did. And so it's like, who's got more? Who cares? Use what you got and elevate others. It's about others. And, and by the way, Jesus did it out of strength, not weakness. Paul did it out of strength, not weakness, right? And, I mean, right after this, he's gonna wash the feet. Did the disciples deserve to have Jesus wash their feet? No, one of them was Judas. In like 10 minutes, he's about to betray Jesus and sell him for a couple bucks, sell him out. It's, it, it, the best picture of this is like a parent who serves a child, right? You don't serve out of weakness, you serve out of strength. Are you with me? So biblical humility is not a low opinion of self. It's just considering others first. And so... Paul is saying, get along with others and put others first. And then we're going to get to the third part. And then he says, and here's, and here's the model, here's the picture. Funny we should mention Jesus, because in verse 5, Paul says, in your relationships with one another, have the same mindset or approach or whatever, have as who? Jesus. So get along with each other put others first. And then number three, follow Jesus's example. This is what Paul is saying. Follow Jesus's example. Well, what is Jesus's example? Well, Paul didn't want to leave it to us to like speculate or figure it out. So he's going to remind us in the next six verses, jump into the first part. He's going to say, and here's what Jesus did starting in verse six, who being in the very nature of God did not consider equality with God, something to be used to his own what advantage was he equal. Was he equal with God? Did he use it to his advantage? No, that's it. You have the power, you have the, the finances, you have the wealth, you have the influence, you have the, 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 the prestige, you have, you have the privilege, whatever. But use it for the advantage of those who don't know what that's like. And guess what? Everybody wins when we do that. So that's what he did. He didn't consider it to be something to use on advantage. In fact, Paul's gonna go in on how far Jesus... Jesus took this. Go to verse seven. Rather, he made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant. Somebody say servant. The path to greatness in the kingdom of God. Right there. That's it. Greatness. Here's what I love. This is my, the most appealing thing to the gospel to me. I've always wanted to be great. I've almost always never felt great. Anybody else relate? Anybody can be great in the kingdom because anybody can be a servant. I usually feel underqualified, undereducated, under-equipped. I, I feel like I got too many things, probably starting with the teams of choice against me. 
But I'm so grateful that the family and the two churches I grew up in before I came here were like, the only way is servant leadership. The only way is serve, serve. So I'm telling you, I have built, and I'm not great at it, but I'm all, I've sold my life out to this. I am all in on this, taking the nature of a servant. Being made in human likeness, Paul goes on, we're gonna get through this. And found himself in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death, death on a cross. Now I can talk about death on a cross a lot, um, but what I wanna mention about it is, is just a couple things. First of all, it was the most heinous version of torture, uh, but beyond that, it was not just physical torture, but it was psychological and status torture. There was no more humiliating way to die than crucifixion. In fact, so much so that if you were a Roman citizen, you could be tortured and executed, but you could never be crucified. That was for them, the lower class. Does that make sense? Yep. Anybody who wasn't a Roman citizen. Not to mention, and so in Roman citizen, in the Roman world, it's ultimate humiliation. It's also ultimate humiliation in the Jewish culture. Well, how do I know that? Because when Moses wrote the book of the law in Deuteronomy, he says, cursed is the one who's hung on a tree. So no bueno in Rome, no bueno Jewish. Jesus submitted himself and he says, I'm going to go this way on my own. And, and so this is what Paul is saying. Like, let's follow Jesus' example, which is what? He literally lowered himself to the, to the max as far as he possibly could, psychologically, physically. He took on the, the, just the lowest of the low. And how many of us, I mean, if we're really honest, how many of us at this point are being, sign me up. I want to follow Jesus on that path. We love God is love. We love God who's began a good work in you, is faithfully completed. He's never going to leave you. He's never going to forsake you. We love that. And that is all true. But you know what else is true? If you're going to follow me, you got to follow me on the path of servanthood. It always gets quiet when I say that. Here's, thank you. I believe you. I believe you, young man, young king. See, Jesus just redefined greatness and did what he did with everything else. And he just flipped it on its head. Go ahead. For becoming human, the Messiah pre-existed in a state of glory and equality with God. And unlike Adam, who tried to seize equality with God, the Messiah chose not to exploit his equal status for his self-advantage. Rather, he emptied himself of status. He became a human. He became a servant to all. And even more than that, he allowed himself to be humiliated. He was obedient to the Father by going to his death on a Roman execution rack. But through God's power and grace, the Messiah's shameful death has been reversed through the resurrection. And now God has highly exalted Jesus as the King of all, bestowing upon him the name that is above all names, so that all creation should recognize that Jesus the Messiah is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Now that last statement is astounding. Paul's quoting from Isaiah chapter 45. It's a passage where all creation comes to recognize the God of Israel as Lord. Paul's point here is very clear. In the crucified and risen Jesus, we discover that the one true God of Israel consists of God the Father and the Lord Jesus. And so for Paul, this poem, it expresses his convictions about who Jesus is and it does more. It offers the example of Jesus as a way of life that his followers are to imitate. It offers the example of Jesus as a way his followers are to imitate. And listen, none of us are ever gonna get this all right, but this should be the goal, the target, the goalpost, right? To serve. And so the, the cost was great. What was it? That Jesus literally lowered himself. Now, Paul does go on, he says, but I want you to show you the reward because whenever you pay the price, there's always a reward on the back end. And so he goes on in verse nine and he says, therefore, because Jesus did this, God exalted him to the highest place, gave him the name that is above every name. Uh, verse 10, that the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. Verse 11, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. So he's saying because he did this, because he paid the price, the reward is he was exalted above every other name. Uh, again, Paul writes in another place and, and uh, throughout the scripture, uh, you see Peter says the same thing. Those who exalt themselves will be humbled. Those who humble themselves will be exalted. It literally in the kingdom, it's this paradoxical down is the new way up. And so uh, we want our reward and, and, and we get our reward, but we have to pay the price, which is how can I serve? I'm here to serve. I am here to serve. In fact, Jesus uh, talked about following his 
example, Matthew chapter 16, he says, whoever wants to be my follower, my friend, my disciple, must, there it is again, deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow me. Now, he wasn't necessarily saying you're all going to get crucified, but this was this idea of voluntarily, psychologically, in status and esteem, going, I'm going to lower myself. He says, follow me. It's like, it's the great, it's why I always refer to the kingdom as a backwards, upside down concept. It's the great paradox. In the kingdom of God, down is the new way up, and up is the new way down. Um, I don't know how many Gen Xers are in the room that know what this is. Anybody remember? Yeah, <laughs> he's going like this, and I know exactly what he means. Chinese, ching fingers, yeah, oh, I did it. Chinese uh, handcuffs, Chinese finger trap, and, and, and again, it's this idea, this is what we did when we didn't have internet, and our parents made us go outside. You put your finger in this, and, 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 and when you get trapped, what is, I mean, anytime somebody tries to subdue you in any way, what is your first inclination? Ah, get off me, right? Resist. Resist. Well, the problem with this is the more intuitive I get, the more I pull, the more I resist, the tighter it gets, the more locked in I am, the less blood flow, you know, all of the above. And so the only way out of this trap, of this trapping, is not to resist and like do what makes sense. It's to go the opposite way. Oh, I got to relax, push it together. I might be in trouble. Oh, right? It's, it's the simplest, dumbest thing, but it's the most beautiful picture of a paradoxical, backwards, upside down greatness. Jesus literally redefined greatness. And so here, I, I, again, one of the things I love is I said, I always wanted to be great. Jesus never reprimanded his disciples for wanting to be great. He just always made sure they knew the path. He, they knew the target. They knew where the goalpost was. In fact, if, if, if you don't take anything else, what's the bottom line of this message? If somebody says, hey, what did you talk about in church this week? This is what I want all of us to hopefully remember and get in our heart. It's what I've been praying for us all week is that the path to greatness is found on the road called servanthood. The disciples often regular, argued about who was great. Never once did Jesus say, how dare you want to be great? He just always made sure they were on the right path. And anytime Jesus talked about greatness, he always talked about what I call the three L's. He talks about it regularly. You know what the three L's are? Last, lowest, least. Every time Jesus talked about greatness, and he talked about it often, go do a Bible study. Last, lowest, least. The path to greatness is found on a road called servanthood. And I love this because anybody can be great because anybody can serve. And it's, but it's counterintuitive. Most of the things in following Jesus, just a quick sidebar, are counterintuitive. Greatness is counterintuitive. Faith is counterintuitive, right? When are we most apt to trust God? When things are going well. When do we have the hardest time trusting God? When things are going bad, because when things are going bad, what are we really thinking and saying? God, you're not doing a very good job of taking care of me right now. Therefore, I will take care of me, which is opposite of faith. It's backwards, right? In a marriage, it's like, oh, I just want somebody who serves and loves me. Actually, if you serve and love them a lot, you're going to have a healthy marriage. And, and again, we've talked here at this church, marriage is a submission competition. If you can get this, like, it really, really works. It's counterintuitive. It, happiness is the same thing. Now, again, there's all kinds of studies and psychology behind it now that one of the secrets of happiness is actually not getting more things for yourself, but it's serving others and, and doing something for someone else. Did you know there's all kinds of data? And some of us are so either obsessed or absorbed with what, what, what happens to us or, or, or what happens to us or what others get that we're just completely miserable. It's leading to the opposite of happiness. Like, you know, we're, we like, we get... Who got the big piece? Who got the thank you note? Who got the affirmation? Who got the attaboy or attagirl for that project at work? Whatever it is. And, and we're just constantly keeping track and, and we're constantly uh, uh, obsessed with it. It's like, but it's not making us more happy. It's making us more miserable. And, and, and so even, even more than the path of greatness found on a road of servanthood, the path of happiness is found on a road called servanthood. I'm telling you, I'm telling you. This is it. This is the God. This is it. It is worth giving your life to. It is worth following Jesus. Uh, it's beautiful. It's attractive. It's hard. It changes the world. And, 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 and there's such a sense of life and purpose in it. And, and serving looks different in your context and how old your kids are and what your job is. And so there's not one way to do it. But man, if we got this in our heart, I'm just telling you, it would be a game changer for some of us. And we got to watch out why. This matters because you're constantly going to have people to come to you be like, and remind you what your duty to yourself is. You owe it to yourself. I don't owe anything to myself. I'm a, I'm a knucklehead. Jesus said, even men being evil know how to take care of their kids. He's like, y'all ain't good. So like, it starts there. 
And so, and, and why this matters is because this stuff, let's, truthfully, we got it. I'm going to give you a couple practical things at the end, but this stuff is easy to listen to. It's easy to read. It's easy to talk about until you're exhausted, until you're tired, until you've had a long week, or until somebody treats you like an actual servant, right? So we get amen all day long in church until we get into the parking lot or go to work and there's email or somebody who we feel we're above, whoops, asks us to do something that we feel is below us, double whoops because neither of those should ever be true. And so we have a few minutes left. Uh, that, that's the heart of it, man. And I'm just telling you, some of you, this is, this is it. And it's why I wanted to give a whole week just to this passage, because it's, uh, I, I, I just can't think of how much this will enhance your life and the life of everybody uh, around you. And so I want to give you five practical steps real quick. I want to give you, if that's the goal, if that's the target, how do we get there? How can I do this more? How can I get this better? This might be worth taking a picture of writing down. These are really, really simple. Maybe some of you are like, I'm going to do all these. Maybe you just pick one, but I'm telling you, this is something you can do. And, and, and I'm, I'm fanatically practical. So I want to give this to you. And so here we go. How do I grow in this? How do I become better at the path of servanthood and, and being like Jesus and following Paul's instructions? And so five things, five ways to get from here to there. You guys ready? Am I still, should we just wrap it up or you got like five or 10 more minutes left? Okay, okay, I'll talk to you. Um, <laughs> number one, here's how you do this. And, and these, these, are, these first three are like really heavy hitting. Number one, stop keeping score. Like we could just wrap it up. We just have the altar call right now. Stop keeping, the record of wrongs, the rec, whatever, stop keeping score. Score keeping poisons the servant's heart. Some of us were so, we're scorekeeping and it's, ah, this happened today and this and that and them and this and that. And, 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 I, and, 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 and maybe you're like, I don't know where I'm at with that. I can, give you, I can give you a surefire symptom of scorekeeping. Anybody want to know what it is just to maybe check yourself before you wreck yourself? <laughs> complaining. Complaining is a surefire symptom of scorekeeping. If you complain a lot, you're probably scorekeeping. And you know why the reason we complain? Let me break this down for you. It's because we think we're getting behind. We complain when we feel like we're losing. When, we, when others are getting, we, we, whether it's at work or at home or with our friends, and sometimes we don't even know we're doing it until we find ourselves saying, man, that's the third time that they, well, that sounds like a scorekeeping statement. That's the fifth, fifth time this week he, oh, we're keeping score. And, and, and why does it matter? Because it poisons our heart. It, it's, it's never gonna get us on the path towards servanthood. See, we, we have a propensity to remember when we're behind, but we never remember when we're ahead, right? So number one, stop score, stop keeping score in your marriage, in your, I mean, this is hard, by the way, this is hard. We can amen at church like, woo, but this will help be good for your heart. Number two, this is probably the hardest one. Start at home. At home, home is the hardest place. Why? Well, because at home I'm me. That's nah, not always a good thing for some of you. <laughs> but most of us would probably say, hey, what are your priorities? God first, family second. Okay, then let's treat our family like the number two priority. Let's not give them the leftovers. Let's start at home. A, a, a great question that's really challenging is, does your family get treated like your best friend? Does your family get treated like your best client? Why do I say that? Because we will go out of our way, sacrifice, go above and beyond without even thinking for our best friend or our best client. Or to keep our job, you know what I'm saying? But if we'll do it for our best friend or our best client, We'll schedule things, we'll make plans, we'll save, we'll do whatever, we'll fly across. Oh, so, like then we should be able to do those things for our family as well. So number one, stop keeping score. Number two, start at home. And number three, this might sound simple, but this is a total mode of heart check. Do it for Jesus. You have to do it. Listen, this is hard enough to do for the right reason. If you do it for the wrong reasons, you got a two week to, to four week life shelf, shelf life. Like it, I'm just telling you, if you won't do it for Jesus, you're gonna have a hard time doing it for anybody else. Do you know why? People are jerks. So you're gonna, if you're doing it for other people, you're gonna be like, this ain't worth it. They don't appreciate it. You're right, it, they probably don't. So that won't work. You have to do it for Jesus. I mean, you ever work in retail or food service? Huh? What would you do? Yes, I'll be happy to go get that, sir. Right? Like, if anybody of us, I felt all the time like working in food service. I was like, oh God, you're so proud of what I didn't just say there. Right? We're so gracious. Why? Because we're going to make a sale, keep our job or whatever. I'll tell you, one of the things that has really stuck with me on this is something my pastor, Pastor Hooker, told me, said a long time ago. He said, you'll know where your heart as a servant is as soon as you're treated like one. Think about that. When you're put low, is it like, 
don't you know who I am? Or is it just affirming of like, oh, thank you for helping me get to where I was trying to get to anyway. You must need this. Go ahead. I know I was here first. Why don't you go ahead? No, why don't you have that parking spot? Maybe next time you're at a busy place, you prefer somebody else. Those two words, two words that really just kind of I meditate on or prefer and defer. Like that prefer and defer. Just those two things, man, just help get you on the path of greatness towards servanthood. So again, number three, do it for Jesus. The last two real quick. Remember the gain is in the pain. Philippians 2, the cost, then the reward, right? The reward comes after the cost, lowering ourselves. What what am I saying? Um, You know, uh, position yourself. Let yourself be put there. Put yourself there uh, intentionally. Um, The the, the reward comes later. And then number five, this one's really good. And this one, we can do this in a lot of different ways. Practice. Somebody say practice. 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 We talk about practice. Practice. Little acts of servanthood. There's tons of ways. Like this is a muscle that must be developed. I'm telling you that being selfless and deferring and preferring does not come natural. Do you know what comes natural? I love me some me. That's what comes natural. My turn, big piece, go first, mine. Right? That's our culture. I mean, I can't even watch cartoons with my kids. I'm mine, 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 mine. Nemo, right? Like, <laughs> practice. So, hey, here's a crazy idea. Next time you're in a busy place with a giant park, like a ton of people, I don't know, like Starbucks or church. What if instead of taking the closest parking spot, you took the furthest one away on purpose? We kind of, this kind of became a thing here. I, don't, I don't, wasn't planning on saying this, but like, there's this thing, like our staff just started parking further and further away. And we talk about servant leadership a lot. Like we park about as far away as we can on campus and still be on campus. Cause like the preschool might need it. And who knows if some, the fire truck's gonna be here today for some reason, whether it's the preschool or somebody falls off a roof cause we're always doing crazy things, you know, whatever it is. And so it's like, it's like this thing. It's like, oh, you know, and it's even become like this kind of jab, like parked pretty close today, didn't you? You know what I mean? Like, it's like, there's your reward. You know what I mean? Like, so just practice it. Let somebody who comes in the door behind you go first. If you see your favorite, maybe take a little piece. Here's just a simple one. There's a book about it, but it's it just try to always be last in line or close to last. There's a book called Leaders Eat Last. It's, I love it. It's just this idea of like, just prefer and defer. What if I don't get any? You know what Jesus said? God doesn't even care about birds and flowers that much compared to you and he takes great care of them. So he's gonna take way better care of you then he has birds and flowers. He's got you. He's got you. I mean, I get the big piece of cheesecake. Some of you don't need the big piece of cheesecake. <laughs> but I have to practice it because it's never going to come naturally. Y'all need to stop looking around when I say that. <laughs> now we can have an altar call. <laughs> what are we talking about? What are we talking about? Jesus wants you to be great. Your pastor wants you to be great. And I wanna invite you on the path of greatness. I wanna invite you to follow me as I follow Paul, as he follows Jesus. And the path to greatness is found on the road called servanthood. Practice it, pray about it, start at home, do little acts of service. I gave you five things. And remember, let's get along. Let's use Jesus' example. How does this work? Now, here's the secret. And we close with this. You can't do this on your own. You can't. If you try it on your own, you'll just be here the rest of your life in your whole heart and soul and mind. You need Jesus to come give you his power and his spirit to do it. It's the only way it works. And some of us, this isn't a strategy to implement. You have to be able to surrender. You have to go, okay, I, I give. And so the, the, simplest, the simplest way I'd say it is you have to let Jesus drive the car of your life. You have to give him the steering wheel. You can't just kind of be in a sidecar. And, and, and for some of us, we, we know this and we need to go deeper. For some of you, I think you're here watching and you've been window shopping. You, you, you like what we do. You've heard about us um, and you know you're safe here and you are. You don't have to believe this, but, but I'm telling you, some of you are like, I want to do this. You won't be able to do this without the power of the Holy Spirit. And the only way you get that is you move out of the driver's seat and you go, Jesus, you take the wheel. Like, I want you to take the steering wheel of my life. And three things are going to happen when that happens. Number one, he's going to forgive all of your sins. Number two, you're immediately adopted into his family as a son or a daughter, which is unbelievable. And then number three, he's gonna start to massively transform you from the inside out. The Bible calls it being saved, born again, whatever you wanna call it. But some of us, the last thing you need to do is grab it. Don't try harder to steer, just, Jesus, you steer, I'm gonna take you at your word. 
And so some of you, maybe I think some of you, you need to move from outside the window to come on in. There's room in the, there's room in the kingdom. There's room in the family. There's room in the, in, 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 the, in the camp of God. Some of us probably just need to implement one thing, but every week we exist to introduce people to Jesus. And every weekend there's people who are moving into the passenger seat of their life and giving Jesus the steering wheel. And I want to give you that opportunity as well. I'm going to pray a prayer. It's gonna be a really, really simple prayer. In fact, I'm gonna invite all of us to pray. It's gonna be really simple. But if you're, if, you're, if you're giving Jesus the steering wheel for the first time, we ask, only thing I'm gonna ask is that before you leave, would you just text the word CAPE YES to 94000. We wanna welcome you to the family of God. Make sure you access the power afforded to you and we want you to help you to understand what it means to be a child of God and walk transformed. And so I'm gonna, I'm gonna invite us to all pray this prayer together because it's gonna cover all of us, I promise. But specifically those of you who are ready to give Jesus the wheel, this is how that starts. Will you join me in prayer? Bow your heads. If you feel comfortable, close your eyes. Repeat this after me. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. More importantly, thank you for Jesus and his example. I want to follow his example to the path of greatness. Give me your spirit. Give me your power. Help me to really do this. I don't just want to say amen. I want to live it. And Jesus, I know that starts with me giving you the steering wheel to my life. So I'm moving over. You're in charge. I need your forgiveness. I want your adoption and I need your transformation. Thank you for doing the work and going first and inviting me in. Now empower me to live the right way. I wanna be great by your standards. In Jesus' name, amen.